Welcome to the Empowered to Connect podcast, where we come together to discuss a healing-centered approach to engagement and well-being for ourselves, our families, and our communities. I'm J.D. Wilson, and I am your host. And today, we wrap up our series looking at National Adoption Awareness Month from a different perspective by talking with Natalie Bergstrasser, um, who is a Cultivate Connection facilitator and... Um, well, I'll just say, I will let her uh, share her story here in a, in a moment. But um, from all of the different angles you could possibly come from, Natalie talks to us today about uh, lots of different things, what it's like um, as a parent being a part of the foster care system, um, what it's like as a parent having been a part of the foster care system as a child, um, all kinds of perspective on that. Again, I don't want to give away um, what she's talking about today, but um, you are going to love her. Just fascinating insight. Um, Really, really intelligent, smart person who is uh, working now in a pretty intense and interesting way to um, help affect change in the system. So uh, great conversation with Natalie and a fun little teaser for something coming up new after the episode. Here she is now, Natalie Bergstresser. Well, here we are with Natalie Bergstresser, and she is going to talk with us about um, a, a wide variety of things. Um, fresh off of facilitator training um, through Empowered to Connect and our Cultivate Connection facilitator training, which that's a mouthful of a sentence. Um, <laughs> so she was just here in Memphis recently, but um, Natalie, thank you for coming first of all and why don't uh why don't we for people who don't know you or know your story do you mind just kind of giving us a background of of maybe first like how you got connected to empower to connect and then we can go through your story yeah oh gosh it's good to be here um so i and i just have to say for anyone who's considering um facilitator training please lean into it because it, it was such a sweet experience for me awesome. Um, but I will say, so I'm a social worker, I'm a macro social worker. So I, I view my work as equipping the saints. So I've done a lot of work on the ground with transition age youth, but really lean into creating opportunity and jobs and policies and fundraising around the folks who are on the ground right now and creating space for that to include, um, practices that are healing and connected. And that's what I love to do. I uh, have foster care experience. I've been around the system since I was around four years years old because my family of origin was a foster and adoptive family, but then I entered foster care as a teenager and then aged out of the system. And now my husband and I are foster and adoptive parents and have had some interaction through kinship placement as well. And so I've worked at the community level in foster care, like I said, predominantly with transition age youth and really passionate there. But now I work for an organization that works at the federal and state level on policy and research work, um, making sure that the best practices that are scalable are actually reaching communities in ways that are meaningful. Okay. That's a lot. <laughs> it is a <laughs> lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Why don't, I, I'd love to start more with kind of your work now and then kind of work backwards and, and talk about your, your upbringing after that. Um, so your work now, you know, this is National Adoption Awareness Month that this will be airing in. And um, so maybe first as an adoptive parent and as somebody with a lot of experience around the foster system and adoption world, when you think about adoption, what are the, the first few things that come to mind um, in your mind? I think about adoption. It's just so nuanced. I think the larger narrative is that like we're all just getting sparkly unicorns, but really it's it's this journey for every person that's impacted by it. And so when I think about adoption, I think a lot about ownership in the sense I've, I've been spending a lot of time reflecting as my kiddos get older on how do I really thoughtfully be sure that I'm giving them space to own their story and own their narrative, even in their own right, like they each have their own narrative. So they don't get to own each other's narrative, but I don't get to own their narrative mm -hmm. just because I also have experience with foster care. And so I think the more I can have those conversations in the world, um, it, it, I just get excited about that because I think that so many times there's this really black and white picture painted and it's just, yeah. it's just not that simple. Never, right? Never, never, ever. Yeah. It's not simple or easy. <laughs> so um, for you, you say you began being around the foster system when you were about four. And so why don't you just kind of like, let just walk us through your childhood and, and 
in that whole journey? Yeah. So my biological family was a foster and adoptive family. So we adopted and then fostered and then adopted again. And so that was a part of my world almost in my earliest memories. I remember talking to social workers and having a conversation sitting on the laundry pile with my parents about bringing home a sibling and what that might be like. I remember when my sibling came home for the first time and what that experience was like and all the mixed feelings of excitement, but jealousy and feeling territorial and wanting your toys and all of that journey um, is really fresh in my memory. And so that was a part of my experience from a really young age. And then unfortunately, there were um, patterns of abuse and neglect that were continued in my own family. And as a result of that, I entered foster care as a teenager and then aged out of the system. Uh, but I think what, with it being National Adoption Month, it's such a tricky thing, as particularly having been someone who experienced foster care as a teenager, that adoption, we, we're generally only talking about the legal term. But for me, right. I mean, I was functionally adopted by my foster family, although not legally adopted. And so I function as someone with two families that hold equal right. weight and love and placement in my life. And so I, I was adopted into a family and I still belong to my family of origin. Yeah. Okay. So some complicated feelings, <laughs> there, obviously. Yeah. I don't know that. Um, do you, I mean, that, if you don't mind sharing that experience of going into the system as a teenager, you know, what, what was that moment like versus the moment of, of being placed? And, you know, do you have memories of like the first, you know, kind of moments of feeling Say for the foster family, like what were those moments like? Yeah. So I was familiar enough with the system that I knew exactly what was happening. I knew what was going to happen as a result of voicing what was happening in my family. And so, rare, right? Most people are not. Yeah. Like, yeah. Age, like, so aware yeah. of the system. Yeah. 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 I was really well versed. I wasn't well versed in like the legal side of it, but I was well versed in the idea of, you know, if, if, if you share these things, then generally, child welfare is going to get involved and you're going to enter the foster care system. And so I was really briefly with like an emergency placement and then with a family member. Um, but pretty quickly, I actually had a really um, rare experience in that I was able to return to my hometown. So I'm from a wow. small town of about 2000 people, lived my entire childhood there. And so my foster family was from my hometown. So wow. after about a couple of days, I actually got to go back to the world that I grew up in, obviously with some really complicated dynamics happening there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I didn't know my foster family before I was placed with them. They were my friend's pastor and his wife. Uh, and so, but I knew of them. I knew of their kids and their family and their ministry. Yeah. So uh, I think the biggest sense of safety for me was being in my hometown, being in, on a street that I recognized, getting to go back to my high school. And, and that wasn't, um, it was, like I said, it was really complicated, especially in the dynamic that um, my family was really involved in the community, but I still got to have the same classes, the same friends, the same teachers. And that was really formative for me in that sense of safety as I built a relationship with my foster family. Okay. That, that seems like in a lot of ways that could have been infinitely harder than going to a new town, right? Like, yes. so were there, you know, I, I would imagine the elements that are more difficult are that every time you go to the grocery store, every time that you're out somewhere, like there's a possibility of you running into your family of origin, right? And, um, or siblings or whatever else. And so, you know, were there, and you don't have to share specific stories, were there moments like that where you're like, oh, oh hey, yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. When I was uh, really, really involved in school, so I was a cheerleader, that sort of thing. So there, I mean, there was a dynamic of, hmm, <laughs> how to say this? Um, I mean, there were folks who believed me and folks who didn't. Mm -hmm. And so that was really complicated as a young person. And oh. I, I was a Christian at the time. And really my heart for the whole situation was help and redemption and restoration. Yeah. It wasn't... Uh, punishment or vindictive. Yeah, vindictive or shameful. I really wanted my family to get help. And yeah. the only means I knew for that was 
to get help through the child welfare system. And so as painful as that was, um, it, it started a journey toward help, at least for me and for my siblings that, um, I knew at the time and I, I know now was the, the right decision, even though it was really, really, really messy. Yeah. So after, tell me about post high school, mm-hmm. um, you technically age out of the system that you were living with the family. And then wh- what happened after that? Yeah. So I aged out of high school or aged out of high school. That's really funny. I graduated from the high school where, you know, I grew up in my hometown and, um, went off to college and really that started the journey for me of functioning as someone, as an adult with two families. And so there was still a lot and there still is a lot of restoration happening with my family of origin. And so my primary family at that point was in my siblings and then my foster family. And so I started to split holidays like folks do even, you know, in a a marriage relationship. I rotated on holidays. Um, and, and that was a really, um, there were a lot of ups and downs in college, but I really leaned into and had some strong mentors who walked me through the gray side of things. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget my senior year of college, both of my sets of parents helping me move out of my house. And that being Mm -hmm. a real moment for me when both of my dads are helping, uh, disassemble my bed so that it can be loaded up to move. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a complicated moving day, right? Like, yeah, yes. things already even, and then- yeah, like even inviting them both to the same place. And they always had like some level of a relationship. And I think maybe for folks who are navigating a relationship with a birth family, the example that my foster dad set was so beautiful and that he really gave me space to own my own experience and my own story. And he believed me always. Mm-hmm. And he was so gentle and, and and persistent in reminding me of grace and what I believed as a follower of Jesus, that the ultimate goal was um, forgiveness, whether it was restoration or not. And that also when he saw good things in me, he didn't do it all the time because remember I was a teenager and walking through like a really fresh wound, but there yeah. were times when he would just stop and say, you know, this thing you do, this, this way you function in the world, you know, he would name some specific thing about me and he would say, your parents raised you that way. They did some really good things. And that really framed the narrative for me going into adulthood. As I started navigating some of the very things that my family of origin had to navigate, like how how do you function in the world when you've experienced a lot of trauma? And so it gave me a different lens of grace, but also I didn't have to like separate myself. I didn't have to say like, now I have this new family because I have two families and I, there's permission to love and honor and be really grateful for the things that both of them contribute in my life and contribute to the woman I am and the woman I'm becoming. And I think every like foster parent and bio parent who hears that sentence is like sigh of relief. Like, Oh, thank God. (laughs) <laughs> that, like yeah. it can feel so complicated. Like you're supposed on, on all different sides of this conversation, right? You can, f- there are so many feelings that come in and maybe one of the biggest battles is not knowing what's valid or not, like what yeah. you should give credence or, to or not. Like, I- am I allowed to feel this? Is this okay? Like, am I, you know, is this okay to be complicated or does it need to be more simple? What? And so I think that's a really beautiful reminder. And and obviously, like you said, none of these conversations um, are the same across the board, right? So like what was safe for you might not have been safe for somebody else and what was safe for somebody else might not have been safe for you. And so I think, you know, that's a, an important reminder. Um, it, so as you're, as you're navigating this through adulthood um, and beginning to kind of establish yourself in the world, at, at what point did you decide social work was the was the, the profession? And, and it feels like that would be like a you really jumped right back in the fire, didn't you? Like it did. It was not intentional. So I, um, I was not really involved in advocacy work as a young person until I aged out of the system and kind of fell into this world of people with lived experience in foster care and advocacy work around that. And so, um, I, I, 
it's a really great question to examine why I actually ended up in social work. I don't think I had this lens of like, I'm going to go back and fix the system or, or anything mm-hmm. like that, which I know is a really common and valid narrative. Yeah. I think for me, I, it, it's something that I'm an expert on <laughs> and I know yeah. a lot about it, but also I am a, a problem solver and I really love connecting dots that others might not connect. And so I started with that advocacy work and then transitioned into like working with transition age youth. And then the more I started seeing some of these gaps, particularly in like community level work, really simple things around like, I know enough about this to tell the story in a way that feels more healthy and more meaningful and more connected than the general narrative around it. So I started speaking and I started writing and I st- then I started fundraising and then I started writing policy because the more I started understanding about all that we're learning about brain science and how we can heal from trauma and what that looks like, the more I was like, well, this needs to be integrated into all of the work we yes. do. And yeah. I had some really one in particular, really strong professional mentors who really shepherded that and saw those skills beyond just my subject matter expertise um, that landed me where I am now, which is almost entirely administrative social work in um, on the uh, federal and state level. Okay. So walk us through a few things. You're talking about policy. You're talking about, you know, yeah being a part of, of advocating in that world. What are a few things that you are passionate about right now changing within the system? Like, are there some things that you feel like are low hanging fruit? Like, Oh guys, we can do this. We can fix this problem or this problem. And this is why. Yeah. Low hanging fruit. I, w- I would say <laughs> the, the biggest one is we have to have to have to involve people who've experienced something in every conversation. I think we, the foster care community would generally agree at this point that we should at some point involve a story of a person who's experienced foster care, but there's so much more expanded beyond that. I mean, we, we have unprecedented access and knowledge around the experiences of foster care. And so instead of just saying, here's this one person, I'm going to give them one opportunity to tell this story. There's so many nuanced details in the experience of the system that I might hear one story and either not be able to really apply any practical change to that. Like I may not be able to look at a policy and say, okay, that should inform this policy this way. But I also may not be able to really understand kind of the details of what that experience is like, the the if thens and the, okay, like, you know, the decision tree part of that. And so I think that we have to involve people who've experienced the system, not just one time, not just in telling their story, not just in fundraising, but they really should be involved and have decision-making um, voice in every single step of our processes, whether that's uh, developing our internal policies, um, thinking about our spaces when people walk into a waiting room, thinking about our intake processes, all the way through exiting the system. I really believe that they should have voice um, and and decision making in in those pieces. I mean, I I agree, and it's a little bit staggering to think that we have such easy access to so many who were in the system and who have now even rejoined the system to try and work toward it. And yet that's not a standard part of policy, right? Or a standard part of the procedure. Like in every other field, you would think you go, you know, when you're beginning to look at policy, you you have experts speak into the needs. And in this one, the experts are not always those who have actually been firsthand experts. And so, gosh, um, Let's talk about the, the foster to adopt side of things. Obviously, there's like within the foster care system, there's a significant portion of um, that world who begin fostering with the intent to adopt in, in situations where parent, parental rights are terminated. And, um, and there's also those that end up having to be adopted, um, not with that not being the original plan of action, so to speak. Do you feel like within that world, again, with this being November and National Adoption Awareness Month, do you feel like there are some things within that part of the system that um, should be refined or that in your own experience, like, no, this is actually really awesome. Like, you know, I imagine it's more complicated than those two options, but um, what was your, what was your experience been in that, in that part of the world? 
Yeah. So I'm in Oklahoma where the concept of foster to adopt doesn't actually exist anymore. And so it's really prevalent in like general society's language around it, but it's not actually, it's, it's not a thing here anymore. Um, And so I will say, and I'll give honor to one of the organizations that I've worked for in Oklahoma called Lily Field, where they really, really held the line of the healthiest thing we can do in shepherding foster and adoptive families is to give them good information and healthy expectation that the system is not set up for foster to adopt anymore. And honestly, that's not our aim. We have all this data now that says that if children can return to their family of origin, then they have better long-term outcomes. That's obviously a very broad general statement, right? So please, you can't read that into every single family, every single situation, but the data on the whole tells us that. And then the other piece is we also see that we have this wave this historical issue of we're bringing kids into foster care because of issues, circumstances surrounding poverty. And particularly in states like Oklahoma, where we have such a limited social safety net, that's happening left and right. And so we come in and the big narrative is that abuse and neglect are the center of the story. But the reality is that like, while there are extreme cases of neglect and we should, we should recognize those that yeah. not, like nationwide, it's 16% of kids are coming into foster care for abuse. That's the vast minority. And so when we think about what is actually happening in all these layers for families. And so I think when we tell that story to folks coming to foster care, it, it paints such a different picture. And then you have the whole narrative that Empower to Connect does so beautifully around like, this is nuanced. There's a lot we know about brain science and healing and connection mm-hmm. and really mm-hmm. leaning into that. But I will say, Lilyfield, where I worked for so many years, they held that line of, we're not going to give you rose-colored glasses. We're not going to promise you that you're going to get to adopt when that's not actually what we're aiming for. Now, there are families who get to adopt and while holding the grief of that scenario, we celebrated and honored that. And I've celebrated and honored that with families. Like it's, it's the both. And, and I think when we hold space for both and when we hold that line and we say, we're going to tell this story with all its twists and turns, then we do better as a system because people aren't making black and white decisions and they aren't telling black and white stories. Now that's really hard (laughs) and really exhausting. Um, But when I I think, so even at facilitator training for Cultivate Connection, we came home and I was was talking to a friend and just saying, it was such a safe space for me to hold that nuance. I don't don't walk in a lot of spaces where I get to hold the both and, and that's the expectation. But when we create spaces like that in our communities, in agencies, in circles of foster and adoptive support groups, those sort of things where we hold the both and, then that is transformative on the whole, on a, on a grassroots level. Uh, yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say that. Like, I, I think that, you know, and I, I think I've said this before on the podcast, but, you know, when we went through the adoption process, we walked into it with a lot of families around us, well-meaning, shrouding us with, guys, y'all are really doing it. This is, this is really God's work. You're really doing this. And you're, I mean, think about the difference you're making for this. You know, at this point, we didn't know, you know, if it was going to be a boy or girl or whatever. We just, so, you know, we're walking into it and it's hard to hear that. We, we both knew deep down, like, I, I promise there's nothing super special going on here. Like we just want to be parents and we, we know there's a need. And so we're stepping into that. And that was the, that was the, the bare minimum knowledge that we had. I think on this side of it being 12 years, almost 13 years into it, it's like, good God, I'm so thankful that we were, that we were, uh, in a place to be told about Empowered to Connect, to be told about classes, to go learn about the brain science, to go learn about the the studies talking about open adoption and relationships with birth families and all of that, that now we have like, and, and I'm, it's not luck, obviously, but, but the phrase would be like, we've kind of lucked into this awareness that we never would have had in our regular course of action in life. And 
that's such a dangerous place to start from because it's really easy to then get isolated when things get hard and you're not able to talk about what's really going on. And so when all, you know, early on in parenting, when all that both and is happening with us and we're just sort of shell-shocked, I remember talking to Mo and, you know, I, I told this part before, like I'm sitting in the church lobby, like looking around, like I'm making a drug deal, like, hey, Mo, um, I'm a terrible parent and I don't know what I'm doing and I need some help, you know? And, <laughs> and that, like that moment, you know, his reaction, because that's all everybody talks to him about. <laughs> like Mo has that conversation 10 times a day, probably. And his reaction was so gracious and kind and, and welcoming and, and made us, it, it was disarming and helped us to feel like it's okay to struggle and all that. Had we not had that, um, it, we, we'd be struggling so hard right now. And so I think what you're saying is completely accurate and, and so necessary that we can have people in communities where um, that conversation is happening to be the banner waivers and say, hey, it's not that simple, right? Like it is, let me give you a different perspective here. Like it is actually not that easy. Um, you know, when you think about, you you touched on one thing that I want us to talk about a little bit more before we wrap up here. And that that is the, the, the role that poverty plays within societal systems that oftentimes leads to um, children going into foster care. And um, I, I've worked in a school system that where 99% of the students in the in the school were on free or reduced lunch. The, the neighborhood um, was in a really tough spot, under-resourced, um, it, you know, all, you name it, the challenges were there. And we know from the data from just that neighborhood alone that I'd studied a lot, and we know from data from poverty stricken communities across you know the world that um, care for children oftentimes um, is lacking in those settings. And so it's not never love, r- rarely is love lacking, but um, knowledge and access to the, to the ne- necessary structures to be able to survive and, and thrive are, are lacking. When you think about that, are there some things that you're working toward right now? Where you, where you would say, Hey, pay attention to these things in local elections. Pay attention to these different systems. Here's how you can help to make sure that these communities are getting the help they need to be able to self sustain over time. Yeah, I'm, I am not often invited to, to voice anything on the policy level. So I, you, you might regret it, but I will say, as followers of Jesus, of people leading in and saying, we want to create the circumstances in our world. We we want to be like Jeremiah 29, right? Like we are working for the good of our city, um, regardless of, you know, so many times it's like, we're so concerned about who we have to stand shoulder to shoulder with to make that happen. But like, we know that in, in the Old Testament, like they stood a, a shoulder to shoulder with all sorts of folks who, who follow God and who did not, yep. and but they were working for their good of their city. And so when we talk about things like access to healthcare for children, access to mental health treatment in Oklahoma, for every uh, 900 people with a diagnosed mental health uh, issue, there's one mental health provider, Ooh. 900 to one. So when we 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 need to be voting for people who are increasing access for families to making sure that they aren't finding themselves in crisis. Yeah. And and it's not about um a, a hand like the the idea of like well that's so tricky. Um we want to make sure that families have access to what they need. Yeah. If we're talking about all, all of Empower to Connect is meeting needs, meeting needs, meeting needs. I function in this world in a way that it is my role given by God to meet the needs of my family. That is my responsibility. Yeah. And as community members, we see in scripture, like I referenced, Jeremiah 29, it is our job to work toward the good of the communities around us. And that involves voting and advocating for policies where people have access to health care, to mental health care. They have access to food. They have access to a living wage. They have access to safe and stable housing. And they have access to the things they need to meet their own family's needs so they don't find themselves in a crisis where it's so extensive and is causing harm. And then we have systems that don't necessarily make things better. I think we could universally agree that intersection with the child welfare system pretty rarely makes things better. Yeah. Um, if I geek out a little bit, so Chapin Hall just released a study about the impact of um, earned income tax credits on, of tangible financial supports for families experiencing poverty and how that affects their entrance in, into the foster care system. And then um, Human Rights Watch and um, 
oh my goodness, another organization just this week released uh, a, a huge study about how people are intersecting with the foster care system because of their experiences of poverty. I, I mean, we could go on a sidebar and talk about this for the next like two and a half hours. I, I completely agree. The one thing I would say, you know, just in, in agreement with you on this is there's oftentimes the the adversarial voice is saying, but you can't just expect to give people everything. It doesn't actually help in the long run. And so we would talk about generational cycles then and generationally broken systems or social isolation or <laughs> all of those things. And I think what what we, when we look at, uh, you know, my my brother was a firefighter for years and, and he used the illustration that when there's a really bad car crash, uh, if the car was not in the best repair, you're not using that moment to say, now listen, this is what you get for driving a busted up car. Like that. No, in that moment you are giving triage, like you're, you're getting people the care they need to stay alive in that moment and getting them to a stable place. And then once recovery is complete, then you can talk about Hey, let's talk about your car choices and like maybe not driving something so old. Like you don't treat when there is catastrophe happening. You don't talk about far off ill-conceived root issues in that moment. You have to take action that's necessary to solve issues in the immediate and then work on the long-term solutions from there. And I think, you know, the long-term solutions we won't see in our lifetime, right? So we do need to put those things in place now and also need to like look at the crises that are on hand and mental health I mean, epidemic that's, that's, um, sweeping the country coming off of, um, COVID. And, um, and so, yeah, again, we could talk about that for the next few hours. Um, thank you for, I mean, one more thing about that. Sorry. please. I just want to, I want to say, I, I would just, for, for folks that are wrestling with this, I would encourage you to consider two things. A lot of the narrative that the world puts out there about these conversations is this othering. So when we think about the kids and the families in our community, they're ours. There are kids right here. There are families right here. They're not someone over there. They're ours. And we have to view every decision, every vote we make through that lens. These are our kids and our families, not someone else's. And then I think the other piece really being, um, I heard an advocate in Oklahoma City, uh, his name is Taylor Doe, say the other day, um, he knows so many families that are working two and three jobs and like they're pulling on their bootstraps, but they're still yeah. struggling. They're, they're surviving and they may, they may intersect with the child welfare system for one reason or another, and they're working and working and working. And so if the bootstraps aren't working, then what will work? And so we have to consider what if the child welfare system, what would it look like if that was not our first line of defense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we for sure have to do this again. We need to have you on 15 more times to talk about all of this. Um, thank you for just sharing your thoughts and sharing your, your, your story and your, your past and, um, all that with us. We really appreciate it. Any, any last thoughts, like for people who are, um, you know, people who are listening today, any last thoughts for them as, as you go? Last thoughts. If you're an adoptive parent, and you're listening to me. I want you to think today, as you're practicing gratitude for Thanksgiving, I want you to start a list of the things about your kiddo that may not have come from your family, that come from their family culture of origin that you love about them. Um, One of my kiddos, her laugh is distinctly like her birth mom's and it stops me in my tracks. And so those things about food, about mannerisms, about culture, about voice and, and all of those things, start a list and share it with your kiddo when they're ready. Golly, that's so good, Nellie. Thank you so much. (laughs) Yeah. All right, we'll have to have you on again soon. (laughs) I'm just never going to stop talking, JD. I have all the opinions. (laughs) But we're here for them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, big thanks to Natalie for joining us. Um, and as I told her at the end of our conversation, after we were off the air, um, she is going to have to come back on at some point to share more. Um, we talked for a long time after uh, getting off the interview, and um, she's a part of some really incredible stuff that's happening right now that um, we would love to share with you at some point coming up in the future. Um, we do have a really, really interesting um mini series coming up in the next few weeks um, with, you know, 
we're going to keep it a secret. So uh, a very, very interesting miniseries coming up. I know that several of you are probably uh, hating my guts right now for not sharing, but uh, a story that quite honestly, um, I did not believe and thought I knew until we started recording and just um, just f- a fascinating um incredible story with uh, heartbreak and redemption and tragedy and triumph and all kinds of twists and turns that you're never going to see. So um, that will be coming very soon. We also have a couple of episodes um, to share with you that are going to be extremely practical, talking about um, ADHD, occupational therapy, several other things like that. So great content coming throughout the holiday season. Um, I hope that you had a great Thanksgiving uh, if you're listening to this as it airs. And uh, we will talk to you soon. So for everybody here, here at Empowered to Connect. I'm J.D. Wilson. We'll see you next week on the Empowered to Connect podcast.